Thanks, Nick. Thank you very much for having me, everybody, at this conference. Um, this is actually my favorite conference in the history of the world for a lot of reasons. And many of these Eric touched on in his opening remarks. Write the Docs is radically open, and Write the Docs is radically welcoming. And one of the things where it varies from a lot of other conferences is that it has no hierarchy. There are no hierarchy of attendees, no speaker badges. You don't have your work affiliations on your badges. Um, everybody has access, everybody can speak. And as a community of documentarians, I think that is a lot of the value that we bring as well, the time to be able to share this time here. We understand and we know the value of our work and the impact of the products and the products and the communities that we support. We've been hearing today and yesterday about how to measure that impact, how to um, help people in open source, how to build communities of friends of the docs, because they are essential to our businesses, our communities, and our products. But I believe that the impact that we as documentarians can have goes way beyond this. It w goes way beyond measurable impact, like how do we reduce the time to the first APA I call or grow adoption of a product. So in this conversation, in this talk, I want to talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity. I want to define those terms, and I really want to talk about how I passionately believe that documentation is a tool that we in this room can use to make all of those things, diversity, inclusion, and equity, better for the, our communities, our businesses, and importantly, for the world. So these terms, um, diversity, inclusion, equity, they get tossed around a lot, and for a long time I used to think of them as pretty much interchangeable. But what do we actually mean when we talk about these? And this is a description from Jess Mitchell, um, who's out of Seattle, and she says that um, diversity is a number, inclusion is a process, and equity is an outcome. And I want to just talk about these very briefly. And when we look at diversity, diversity is table stakes. Diversity is the very beginning. It refers to the presence of difference. There is a diversity of stickers on that table. There are a diversity of opinions about the ending of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Without diversity, there can be no equity. But diversity is just table stakes. It's a number. But I think a lot of us who are working in technology, we already know that these numbers are not where they should be. These numbers can be pretty grim. Before I go on, I want to talk, mention this is a very brief talk. It's only about 15 minutes long. So I'm going to be skipping over and alighting a lot of things. Um, here I'm going to be talking about uh, gender differences. This is, of course, one of only many, many differences. Ability, race, LGBT status, all the rest. Um, and it doesn't even begin to touch on the complexities of the intersectionality of these differences, what happens if you're a disabled person of color who doesn't speak English, etc. But let's just take gender for one. And this, let's take this as a representation of the general population. We've got this, the bulk, um, I done male, female, and um, a smaller number that is uh, binary or trans or non-binary. So, but if we go into who's professional programmers, um, very, you can say that women make up around 21, somewhere between 21 to 25 percent of these. Not good, but um, it's an awful lot better than it is in the open source world. That's the open source world, and just, I, uh, I'm going to help you out there, that's 3 percent. This is based on the GitHub study of uh, surveys. And this, um, this is kind of uh, worrying for all sorts of reasons, because everybody in this room, I think, um, understands that it's diversity that brings the power and richness to open source communities. This, it's diversity of thought and accountability that gives it its power. We also understand that it's diverse communities and companies. Those companies, they solve problems faster, they're more creative, and in fact, they make a lot more money. So. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. And this, this disparity, uh, gender disparity, is worrying for those reasons, but for a lot of other reasons also. And this is one of them, because increasingly we're in a world where you see people and recruiters and saying, 
We want to see a track record of contributions to open source because that is your way into these well-paying jobs, these good jobs that are out there. And there's a lot of issues and challenges around this. Build up a uh, thing of open source and you'll get a job. And one of them is beyond the scope of this talk. It's, there are some challenges we want to need to think about the requirement for people to work for free. The second one is that if open source is becoming a conduit uh, for working in proprietary software, and it clearly is, then this disparity that we see in the open source world, it's going to entrench um, the lack of diversity in proprietary software. It's got the potential of making it much, much worse for everybody. But thirdly, and this is really important, this emphasis on open source can represent an overwhelming barrier to underrepresented folks. Maybe people without formal uh, computer science degrees or pathways to tech, to whom open source now represents yet another hurdle that they must overcome in order to get a job that makes a living wage. Because the truth is that this is not a path that is equally open to everyone. Free time is an incredibly precious resource, and for many, it's extremely scarce. Like, chew on this one thing in particular. On average, in the United States, women perform about 234 minutes a day of unpaid labor, compared to men's 137. That's even, um, that's across the board. And yet, over and over and over in the open source world, we see answers like this. I've redacted the name because I'm a good person. But you can see that somebody can say, how do I learn open source frameworks? You can always read some books, and if that doesn't help either, you can work on your own software projects for a couple of years. That's almost unspeakable level of privilege for here. So for me, if I want to work in open source, I'm actually really lucky. I have a good job, I have leisure time, I don't have any kids, I don't have to worry so much. For me, this thing about time is, do I work in this open source project or do I watch Game of Thrones or something? But imagine if you're in a different situation. Do I have the money to pay a babysitter $20 an hour while I work on this project? Can I take out time for my second job? to work in this project. I'm already working a job and attending a boot camp because that's my entry into the world of um, software. Can I do this? Because open source is a pathway for people and especially underrepresented folks to get into these jobs. There are a ton of problems around seeing open source contributions as a leisure time activity. And when you're in this situation and you need this information, lack of documentation is an extremely effective barrier to inclusion. So we'll talk about what inclusion is. And one of the things that is um, very clear, I think, is that workplaces and communities and open source groups can be extremely intimidating places, especially if you're new, especially if you're not part of the in-group. Contributing to open source in particular requires yourself, us to make ourselves vulnerable and to do so to people who are all over the world who we may never see. To feel safe requires inclusion. And here's one def definition of inclusion, which is, um, comes from Verna Myers, a consultant. She says that diversity is being asked to a party. Inclusion is being asked to dance at the party. I think this is a pretty good uh, description, but I have some issues with it. Um, an invitation is something like tolerance that can be withdrawn at any time. It, implicit in this is this kind of power imbalance. I think that this is a better description, that diversity is going to a party, but inclusion is being a member of the party planning committee. You actually have a place at the table. A diverse con community contains different kinds of people. An inclusive community ensures that all of these people are welcomed, valued, supported, and given the opportunities to thrive. Not all diverse communities are inclusive, but without com inclusion, diversity is entirely meaningless. And we think about this a lot in Google, and I work on the open source strategy team, so a little while ago, we commissioned a study to figure out why, what are the barriers that stop people from um, uh, contributing to open source. Too much to share here in the li limited time we have, but um, here's the TLDR. Psychological safety is paramount 
It must be present in order for people to feel safe contributing. And documentation is critical to creating a safe, welcoming and an equitable environment for all contributors to succeed. And equity means different things. Equality means that you're giving everybody the same. And you can see this is a fairly well-known graphic that's going around. But equity is recognizing that we are coming from different places and that in order to have the same end result, we need different support, we need different starting places. Not everybody starts out with the same advantages. Equity is a process that begins by acknowledging differences. And by acknowledging differences, we also acknowledge that um, people are starting from unequal places. And it is a process by which we continually seek to correct and address that imbalance. So how can we, as documentarians, how can we support and promote inclusion and equity? There's a lot of ways we can do it. And one of the things um, is to think about is the existence of tribal knowledge. We saw earlier, just read the code, reach out to somebody, talk to them. This is where you can do this. The truth is that tribal knowledge is bad. Tribal knowledge, first of all, assumes the presence of a tribe and an outgroup. You are either in or you are out. And tribal knowledge concentrates power in the hands of the privileged few. I think we all know this intuitively. Um, if you look through legends and stories and continuous trope and fiction, there's always the hidden book, the book of power, the scroll where the hero or the heroine finds the information they need. There is a reason why it was a crime to teach enslaved people to read. Putting knowledge in the hands of people threatens the dominant order. The thing is, though, we're saying that this is the thing of privilege, but everybody in this room is privileged in a lot of different ways. We don't share all the same privileges, but in the Venn diagram of our privileges, we are all able to attend this conference today. Maybe our employers did it, or maybe we have the means, or we were able to get a scholarship to go. Um, we can all understand English, and so this content is available to us. If we are not American, we were able to get a visa to travel here, and we were able to enter the country in order to do this. One of the most important privileges that we're getting is that by just attending these conferences, we are meeting people, we are forming connections, and we are learning things that are going to boost our careers. We are gaining social capital, that I feel I can reach out to Nick now if I have a problem. Somebody can go and ask that. That is an enormous privilege that we have that is going to grow our careers and our economic status, and we are all going to benefit from it. But the, there is nothing wrong with having privilege. There's, it is just something we have, like blue eyes or green eyes, but it is a currency that can be spent and shared for the greater good. And, and by for the greater good, we know that doing this makes us happier and better as well. It is not something to be hoarded jealously against old age, like the way Smaug sits on his diamonds. We should be out there and spreading it around. And the people in this room, we know that knowledge is power. We know the effect of our skills at document, uh, documentation on our businesses and our communities. We know that the work that we do is good and important. Knowledge is power and documentation is the tool by which we rebalance a power deficit. If we as documentarians can ensure that we document the norms and practices of our workplaces and communities so that they're accessible to new people, we reduce that deficit. If we document our projects and our code so that they are accessible and usable by people everywhere, we reduce that deficit. If we do whatever we can to ensure that knowledge is accessible to everybody, regardless of disability or language or social capital, we reduce that power deficit. If we give people the knowledge they need to participate in this industry, this amazing industry with all the opportunities that it gives, if we um, give the knowledge to take advantage of the economic advancement that is an offer, we reduce that power deficit. And if we take our privilege, perhaps as a member of an open source community, or perhaps in the greater documentarian 
community and we use that privilege to reach out to unrepresented folks who have information, who are aware of what is missing and we encourage their contributions to bring that back into the community, we reduce that deficit. And if we can convince our company or organization that documentation is a core part of building equity and inclusion, of building an inclusive organization, we reduce that deficit. Everybody wants to change the world. This is a way we can do it. Power to the people. Thank you for having us here. It has been a privilege. See you.